Hello. And did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountain green? Jerusalem is known and even sung by almost everyone today. The man who wrote the words and many other poems, such as Tiger, Tiger, William Blake, died in 1827 in total obscurity. William Blake spent his life almost entirely in London, working as an engraver by day and pursuing his own personal vision by night. He was considered eccentric, even mad by his contemporaries. He saw angels and conversed with spirits, visions which to him were as real as the material world around him. A hundred years later, Blake was recognized as an enormous literary figure and a powerful and original painter. For many too, Blake is a prophetic voice, almost a religion in himself. His was a world in which all of life, the imagination, reason, the concrete and spiritual worlds were connected, a view completely at odds with the science of the day, but which now chimes with some of the thinking emerging at the end of our millennium. Last week, a new biography by Peter Ackroyd was published, and in David Thomas's film, he is our principal guide to Blake's visionary imagination. What, it will be questioned when the sun rises, do you not see a round disk of fire, somewhat like a guinea? Oh, no, no. I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Jerusalem is one of the most complicated poems Blake ever wrote. And did those feet refers not to Jesus, but to Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple who came to these islands in AD 63. And according to legend, established the Christian faith here. satanic mills. Now, the general impression seems to be that Blake is referring here to the Industrial Revolution and to the north of England. In fact, he was doing nothing of the kind. The mills for him was an abstract symbol of Newtonian mechanism and Newtonian materialism. But more importantly, on Blackfriars Road, just outside Lambeth, where he lived, the Albion Mills, the first industrial flour processing plant in the country, was burnt down in 1791. He would have passed the blackened ruin of the Albion Mills the whole time. The bow of burning gold, the arrows of desire, are on one level, of course, images of sexual gratification a reflection, at least, of his mundane existence upon the earth, although he transcended those mundane references by turning them into a hymn to spiritual power and sexual liberty. green and pleasant land, we can say, the Sussex. Blake never left London except once in the whole course of his life. He wrote the poem, we think, in Sussex. We all know Jerusalem. Everyone has sung it at some point or other in their lives, and it's become a sort of unofficial national anthem. William Blake wrote it here in Felpham, but it's not quite the poem it seems. It's not a hymn at all. It's not even a poem. It's a preface to one of his prophetic books. 
Jerusalem for Blake meant the divine body of Jesus. It meant the palace of the imagination. It meant the emanation of the giant Albion. All concepts which meant a great deal to him, but probably don't mean, mean a great deal to the people who sing it today. It's hardly likely that he would have approved of his words being used as a kind of celebration of national consciousness. He was an anti-monarchist. He did not support the established church. He was a dissenter in every sense. Even in this garden, he was accused of using treasonous words against the king and was put on trial for sedition in Chichester. What happened was this. He found a soldier called Private John Schofield lounging about, as he put it, in the garden. Blake uttered various seditious sentiments, one of them being, damn the king. He was then summoned to appear in front of a court and the jury came back with a verdict of not guilty. But for Blake, it was a period of extraordinary nervous fear. The whole weight of the state and authority fell down upon him. It was as if his entire work was being put on trial. Blake grew up into a city which was dark, violent, repressive. Throughout his lifetime, England was almost continually at war, with resultant blockades, famines, riots, and strikes of all kinds. And there was the French Revolution and the Gordon Riots of the 1780s. So London was, for many days and sometimes weeks on end, at the mercy of mobs. And the authorities were, of course, so fearful that massive measures of repression were taken. So for Blake, it was like living in a maelstrom. Well, Blake was in almost every respect a typical Londoner, uh, born in Broad Street, Soho, a guy who earned his living all his life. He wasn't this mad visionary living in a garret. First of all, he was an engraver's apprentice, then he was a shopkeeper, and then he spent the rest of his life as a jobbing engraver. But you've got to think of this guy earning his living all the time and only able to work on his own time in complete isolation. He was disparaged, he was neglected, he was ignored, he was ridiculed. His poetry wasn't read, his art wasn't taken seriously. But here we come to the essential genius of the man. He was a cockney, he was stubborn, he was a visionary. He knew that his visions were real. So what did he do? He carried on writing and painting. He created a new form of art. He created the relief etching technique by which words and images were put together. And now we realize that those works which he completed in utter obscurity are some of the finest of the whole 18th century. And one of his paintings is inscribed the phrase, I labor upward into futurity. And I think there came a point when he realized that that was going to be his audience. It was the audience of eternity, as it were. I am perfectly content to carry on my visionary studies here unannoyed. I may converse with my friends in eternity, see visions, dream dreams, and prophesy and speak parables, free from the doubts of other mortals. But only in London can I do this. My London. It is odd how this city of necessities has become a city of elegance. There are as many booksellers as there are butchers, and every engraver turns away work he hasn't the time to finish. Yet no one brings work to me. Madman, I have been called. Fool, they call me. Yet I wonder which they envy, thee or me. I laugh at the goddess Fortune, for I know she's the devil's servant ready to kiss anyone's ass. I labor upwards into futurity. I can think of no other great artist in our history so cut off from success and even an audience in his time. I can think of none to his extent. But uh, on the other hand, he kept remarkably cheerful, didn't he? He would talk of the great audience in the sky someday would do him justice, as indeed they have. But at the time, he was compelled to do what he, he had to do. I mean, what is the thing about man of talent does what he can, a man of genius does what he must. If ever there was a man of genius, 
it was that. And also a real sense of uh, joy about life. I mean, he died singing. He sang his poetry, always, whenever he got the chance to. We don't know exactly what melodies he, he employed, but we know he would sing to friends. He'd sing at parties, he'd sing to his wife and sing to, uh, you know, in, in gatherings. Um, in a sense, he thought of himself as a bard. Now, it's important to remember that for him, the bardic voice was something very, very central. It was almost the origin of his genius. He had read the Bible as a child. He had read Milton. And he thought in combining the Bible, combining Milton, he was creating a public voice and a prophetic voice which would reawaken the spiritual longings of the English people. But the soul of sweet delight can never be defiled. To create a little flower is the wisdom of ages. Piping down the valleys wild, piping songs of pleasant glee. On a cloud I saw a child, and he smiling said to me, Piper, sit thee down and write in a book that all may read. So he vanished from my sight, and I plucked a hollow reed, and I made a rural pen, and I stained the water clear. And I wrote my happy songs, every child may joy to hear. Blake himself used instruments of the day. Uh, probably the uh, church organ, or the pump organ, or harmonium. And uh, what I have here in my lap is a miniature pump organ. Uh, it has a bellows and keys. It has two and a half uh, octaves. So it's probably not that different from the instrument that Blake may have used. He was an 18th century Londoner in an 18th century setting. So he, what was he listening to? Street ballads, popular songs, the Methodist hymns of the period, all the songs and airs in the air around him. And those are precisely the sources from which some of his great lyrics spring. There was a lass of Islington, as I've heard many tell, and she would to fair London go find apples and pears to sell. And as along the streets she flung with her basket on her arm, her pears to sell, you may know it right well, Blake was the greatest poet of London in the sense that its sounds and sights and images and words reverberate through his prophetic books as well as through his lyrics. But for him, London was not just the city of the poor and the repressed, as it was, but it was also the city he called infinite London, spiritual fourfold London. He saw eternity in the streets of London. For him, it was a visionary city as well as a real city, and he could understand the visionary truth of his own imagination even as he walked through the streets of London. I behold London, a human awful wonder of God. He says, return, Albion, return. I give myself for thee. My streets are my ideas of imagination. I write in South Moulton Street what I both see and hear. I see thee, awful parent land, in light Behold, I see. When I was a child, I had a, a similar experience where I was on, I think it was uh, Kingsway. And I was walking down Kingsway, and very suddenly, the people walking through the streets. Uh, the traffic, the, the hive of movement, suddenly uh, was transformed into lines of light which seemed to have some ulterior and grander movement, uh, which I didn't quite understand. But I, I, I was realized at that time that London itself could be seen as an organism. Uh, and Blake himself has, has the very same sense. So for him, London was a spiritual reality. It was part of the divine vision. The fields from Islington to Marlebone, to Primrose Hill and St. John's Wood, were builded over with pillars of gold, and there Jerusalem's pillars stood. My mother groaned, my father wept, into the dangerous world I leapt, helpless, naked, piping loud, 
like a fiend hid in a cloud. I was put to Mr. Parr's school of drawing in my tenth year. The school was on the left-hand side of the Strand as you go cityward. There was no drawing from the living figure. And ever since then, I've thought that drawing from life is more like drawing from death. Nature weakens, deadens, and destroys imagination in me. As a boy, I could stand for hours looking at pictures in simple fascination. I was eventually apprenticed at the age of 14 to Bazir, the engraver, so that I might earn a living. He sent me off to Westminster Abbey every day. He had me copy the likenesses of the ancient nobles from their monuments. Blake was the last great religious artist England has ever produced, but there was no religious tradition which he could draw upon. So he went back to the effigies he knew in Westminster Abbey in order to recreate an art of visionary clarity. And so single-handedly, he created his own religious iconography, a spiritual art which has no predecessors and certainly no successors. He saw himself attached to and wanted to become part of an ancient English tradition. That's why he was so interested in the Druids. That's why he created the myth of Albion, which is the old name for England. He wanted to connect himself with a medieval Gothic English tradition, which he thought was being ignored and despised by his contemporaries. And that's why he went back to Westminster Abbey again and again. Once while I was there, I saw a line of monks walk towards me. They talked softly amongst themselves, and I strained to hear their voices. I wanted to call out to them, but the vision was so beautiful, so serene, that I did not dare to break the spell. The point about Blake's visions is they were not some romantic epiphany or some occasional phenomenon. He saw them continually. He saw them from his earliest childhood. They distracted him in company. That's why he sometimes seemed so out of place with other people, because he could see something behind their shoulder, perhaps. Uh, they interfered with his work. There were times when he simply couldn't work because there were visions around him. They reduced him to poverty. Sometimes they oppressed him to the point of madness. And sometimes they elevated him to the point of spiritual vision. He started seeing them when he was very, very young. I think about the age of three or four, he saw God peeping from the window in Broad Street. It was at the age of four that God first showed me his face, when he put his head to the window and set me screaming. This was undoubtedly a cause for some concern to my honest parents. And I confess I'm eternally grateful to my father for not whipping me then, as he threatened to do. And to my mother, for the curious smile she lent to my defense. Because of this experience, and others like it, they were afraid to send me to school. And it was my mother who taught me to read and write. I taught myself Greek and Latin, and even now I'm learning Hebrew. The Testament is my chief master, for it is the true source of all knowledge. I thank God I never was sent to school, to be flogged into following the style of a fool. Instead, I would set out on endless walks. I was a strange youth, no doubt. Once in a field near Dulwich, there was a tree amongst whose branches glistening angels clustered and sang. The angels looked to me like thoughts, bespangling every bough, like stars. But dearest to my heart was my brother Robert. Bob, when he was ill and the pain grew too much to bear, he would cry out, and I would lie down beside him and put my arms round him and hold him while he shook. Robert Blake was William Blake's younger brother. He, of all the Blake family, he was the one closest to William Blake himself and the one William Blake shared in some part his genius. He said he saw Robert Blake in vision, 
so the spirit of Robert Blake remained with him for the rest of his life. In a sense, it was Blake's brother, Robert, who introduced Blake to the work of Emanuel Swedenborg, who was a visionary, formulating a series of doctrines. The brother died very young, and Blake sat by his bedside for two weeks as he lay dying. And then at the moment of death, Blake saw the spirit of his dead brother rising to the ceiling, clapping his hands for joy, as he put it. One night, the room grew cold. Robert looked up over my shoulder and pointed to the window. I turned to look, and at that precise moment, I saw a star fall. And when I turned back to Robert, I saw his soul rising to God, clapping his hands for joy and singing in the spirit. Swedenborg talked about his visions quite openly. He was taken up to heaven and conversed with angels, for example. Now that sense of life, that sense of visionary life, is of course something which appealed to Blake very deeply. Here at last was confirmation that someone other than himself conceived of visions in the same way as Blake did. Um, Swedenborgianism, of course, was only one of a number of uh, sects. In the 1780s and um, 1790s, you see an extravagant uh, melange of political dissenters, uh, radicals, mesmerists, spiritualists, uh, sexual magicians, conjurers, and so forth. That's the community in which Blake really has his being, this working-class artisan tradition of dissent, whether it's uh, political, spiritual, or religious. When he was uh, an apprentice engraver, uh, opposite him was the Freemasons' Paul than the Freemasons Tavern. So from a very early age, he was used to what you might call the occult or occluded side of spirituality. This was in Bloomsbury in Great Queen Street. Now Blake always had a very strong sense of place. There's no one who had quite a strong sense of place as he did. And he knew London to be a vision of eternity. The peculiar thing is that in the area he knew very well, which is the area of Bloomsbury, radical cults surfaced throughout the period of his own life. And the same area still houses other spiritual or radical sects. And we have the British Museum itself, of which one of its most famous librarians was an astrologist, Richard Garnet. We have the Theosophists, we have the Order of the Golden Dawn, we have the Astrological Bookshop and the Occult Bookshop. We have the Freemasons, we have the Swedenborgians still. And what was it about the the Swedenborgian precepts, which so attracted uh, a wide variety of London artisans and so forth. What, were the, what was specifically different and unique about it? Well, it was sort of, as I understand it, a new understanding of what Christianity should really be about and a new understanding of what is in the Bible. And I think things that particularly appealed to many was the idea of the reality of the afterlife. I remember uh, uh, Blake, just before he joined the Swedenborgian uh, church, had had a vision of his brother Robert on his deathbed. Yes. Uh, can you explain about that process of the, the spiritual, the physical form being reassumed? Well, Swedenborg says this world is just a preparation for our future life to eternity, and that there is another world. It's not in time and space, but it is around us all the time, and the spirits are around us, but we don't see them. In our earth, with our earthly eyes. But when we die, people are, uh, go to this other world where they live a life very similar to this one. And um, they assume depending, a sort of human form. Don't exactly, they? yes. Yeah, yeah. And if they are happy together, they live together, even as husband and wife, which again was a very appealing idea to some people. So rather like Blake and his wife. Yes. Uh, so when Catherine says, I speak to, after his death, I speak to William yeah. hourly and daily in the spirit, you can think that might. Be literally true. Right? Yes, that's what she understood. And you think there's nothing absurd about that? I mean, Not at all. I have been married for 45 years to my dear Catherine, Kate. She is a remarkable woman, and she has never complained in all these years. Kate knows that I'm commanded by the spirits to write and to paint. So when the cupboard is bare, she simply lays an empty plate on the table to remind me that we must eat. Kate, 
the point about Catherine, I think that without her presence in his life, he probably would never have been able to create. She cooked his food, she made his clothes, she coped with their poverty, but more importantly, she shared his visions. Throughout his life, Blake emphasized what he called sexual energy. Energy is eternal delight, he used to say. Uh, even at the end of his life, he was talking about the importance of polygamy and promiscuity as emblems of the human condition. There's that marvelous line in his poetry about what a man and woman does desire are the lineaments of gratified desire. Now, as far as one can tell, that was a theoretical statement on his part. There's no evidence that he was ever unfaithful to Catherine. But it's very important to realize that part of his visionary uh, and spiritual capacity and understanding was this celebration of sexual license, celebration of energy, celebration of desire. He said sooner murder an infant in a cradle than nurse unacted desires. And he joined the Swedenborgian New Church in 1789. Above the portal of the chapel were the words, now it is allowable. Because as far as he was concerned, the enemy was the established church. I went to the garden of love and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore, and I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be, and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. Love. There is a smile of love, and there is a smile of deceit, and there is a smile of smiles in which these two smiles meet. He would say no word is an accident. It has to be right. What are the priests in black gowns are making their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. Now, no wonder the post-war generation looked again at him and thought there was more to him than what was being sung at schools in Jerusalem and the, um, and the big Albert Hall meetings and began to listen. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? But in what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wing dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What First of all, the rhythm as trochaic is exquisite representation of heart beat. Boom, 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 boom. And when my heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet, so that the consonants of the heartbeat and the trochaic rhythm are the same. And then you realize that what the poem means is that the, both the tiger and the lamb rose out of the human imaginative heart, that we created these polar opposites out of our own hearts, bodies, imagination, uh, then the whole thing is a kind of unified crystal. What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry?
when Blake exhibited his, his paintings, of course, they were ridiculed as being offensive, muddy, uninteresting, too primitive. It was considered the work of a madman or of a fool who was getting too big for his boots. Portrait painting. I'll be damned if we stoop to portrait painting. We'll start with the line, the outline, the bounding line. The great and golden rule of art, as well as of life, is this. The more distinct, sharp, and wiry the bounding line, the more perfect the work of art. Great inventors in all ages knew this, and they know each other by this line. Raphael and Michelangelo and Albert Dürer are known by this, and by this alone. Leave out this line, and you leave out life itself, for all is chaos again. Blake's art, on one level, is an art of outline. It's an art of pure form. That's because, like Dewar, Dewar said, uh, my figures come from within, by which he meant he painted from his imagination. He didn't paint or reproduce the natural world. That was exactly Blake's own sense of his art. That's why he loved medieval art in general. He wanted an art which was almost monumental, stark, heroic. He wanted an art which was both grand, but also very clear. He wanted an art which suggested the spiritual outline of the human form, rather than the visible outline of the human form. As a result, he hated what he called the blots and blurs of oil painting. He loathed uh, the prettifying tendencies of uh, a Gainsborough, for example. So what did he see around him when he uh, began his career as a painter? He saw the salon art of the fashionable figurative painters of the period, whether uh, Reynolds or Gainsborough. He saw the art which was admired by the Royal Academy. What do you want? Sir Joshua Reynolds, the eminent dwarf of the art world, who founded the Royal Academy so that none but fools should be in the arts. You say there is obviously very little art in this old fool. I need to take classes. I should study. Study. If art could be learned, Sir Josh, as you propose, we should have a hundred Raphaels and Michelangelos to succeed and then improve upon each other. But it isn't so, you delirious dilettante. Keep away from my canvas. The question in England, thanks to you, is not whether a man has talent and genius, but whether he is passive and polite, a virtuous ass, obedient to the opinions of noblemen. Though a man can never become a horse or an ass, Sir Josh. Some are born with the shapes of men who are both. You and your cohort, Gainsborough, blot and blur one against the other till you've divided the whole English world between you with your damn portrait painting, and I am hid. Some look to see the sweet outlines and beauteous forms that love does wear. Some seek to find out patches, paint, bracelets and stays and powdered hair. Now get out of here, you, you blue boy, you and your gang of cunning hired maids. Blake would sometimes talk about uh, his conversations with other artists. He didn't only have this gift, um, he elaborated upon it. He used it as the center of his work. He painted the ghost of a flea, for example. He painted various visionary heads, which he summoned up. So these spirits were as real to him as the people he saw walking around him. And it was so matter of fact that he would talk about them to friends and say, oh, there's so-and-so, I'm talking to so-and-so. They were like the inhabitants of his world. There was, they were comrades, they were collaborators, they were colleagues like Michelangelo. Aye, who can paint an angel? Michelangelo could. How do you know? I know, for I sat for him. I am the Archangel Gabriel. Oh, you are, are you? I must have better assurance than that of a wandering voice. You may be an evil spirit. There are such in the land. You shall have good assurance. Can an evil spirit do this? I looked whence the voice came, and was then aware of a shining shape with bright wings who diffused much light. As I looked, the shape dilated more and more. He waved his hands. The roof of my study opened. He ascended into heaven. He stood in the sun, and beckoning to me, moved the universe. was the Archangel Gabriel. 
Blake saw the world as part of eternity. He's not talking simply about some ghost coming to see him. He's talking about an intimate spiritual communion with the art of the past and an art which he believed he was preserving or reaffirming in a century which paid no attention to it. Of course, 200 years before, he would have been considered blessed because of these visions. The only argument would be whether they came from God or the devil, but the actual fact of the visions would be taken almost for granted. It's, it was his tragedy, I suppose, to be born into the, uh, the age of burgeoning materialism and industrialism, which banished these visions to the fringes of human consciousness. There's a wonderful epigram, God does keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. Now, what he meant by that was that Isaac Newton was for him the embodiment of the mechanical material universe. Here was a scientist who talked about voids and particles and measurement. That was the world which Blake despised because he knew it was not the world, not the reality he knew, and not the reality which his poetry and painting celebrates. Newton, of course, was a rationalist and a, a mathematical genius. They're sort of opposite poles, but if you're ever looking for a definition of genius, you have two perfect types. You still find in the scientific world absolute Newton archetypes, and you still find in the art world sort of Blakean mavericks. I like to think I belong to the latter. Some of the Newton's ideas have been re-examined and been overhauled and out distanced, whereas I think there will always be a new meaning in, uh, for Blake because of his, he's the archpriest of spirituality. Well, I have this postcard here of Newton. What Blake is showing there is a fallen angel trapped in the cave of his perceptions. Uh, do you see anything else in it or is, I mean, what do you see? Well, I think the, the idea of a fallen angel is a very good one because angels are beings of light before they fall and there's something still divine in the form of Newton. But what he's doing is drawing these abstractions, these lines on paper, a two-dimensional geometrical model in a world full of colour and quality and movement and form. And in that sense, I think Blake pictures it very well. I mean, there is something noble about Newton and inspiring. That the whole of the 18th century rationalist movement, the so-called Enlightenment, was based on this idea of Newtonian reason as the ultimate. But mm. what's wrong with it is that it's a limited form of reason, a limited vision of things. And in this picture, you can see there's so much else in the world. And interestingly enough, what Newton left out in his abstract geometries is something that modern science is now beginning to bring back in through chaos and fractals. The new kind of um, mathematical imagery we have has left Newtonian abstractions far behind, even within orthodox science. And you're not surprised that someone like Blake would have reacted against this ferociously, calling it the tree of death and so forth. I mean, it must have struck a, a sort of nightmare chord within him. It would indeed have been a nightmare. There was no spirit, there was no soul. Nature was dead and inanimate. There were no angels or consciousnesses in, uni in the universe. Mm. Animals and plants were machines. And I think it's had a huge impact on our civilization. It's split the sciences from the arts. It's split science from religion. It's fragmented our whole culture. And I suppose Blake, in a sense, was remarkably prescient, wasn't he, in his attacks upon Newtonian science. For example, he denied causation. He said every natural effect has a spiritual cause. And he talked about when the organs of perception change, objects seem to change. That seems to strike a very modern chord, doesn't it? In modern science, there's been a, a, a recognition of the obvious in quantum physics that all observations depend on observers. Mm. And so the human mind has come back, in, a, in a, albeit in a very stripped down and, and not very interesting form, but it's had to be admitted at last by scientists mm. that our observations depend on us. Our theories are products of our own minds. His central perception was that the imagination is human existence itself. That it, that it looks into eternity uh, uh, from all its angles. Is that something you would agree with him about? Well, I think the imagination has to be seen of as much larger than our merely limited human minds. And since Blake believed in angels and God, um, th there's a whole realm of consciousness of imagination that goes far beyond the human realm.
if I understand Blake correctly, he was talking about a living world, a world permeated by consciousness and spirit, full of life and quality. I think the science of the next millennium, certainly the next century, will be much closer to the kind of view that Blake was trying mm. to give. Man is born like a garden, ready planted and sown. This world is too poor to produce one seed. And I have fought for all these years, armed with the one power alone which makes a poet. Imagination, divine vision. O oh, Rose, thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night, in the howling storm, has found out thy bed of crimson joy. And his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Well, when I read, uh, O Rose, Thou Art Sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does your life destroy. It's almost hard to think about it. It's so extraordinary and so aware that, uh, that if, I, if I, one poem changed my life, it would be that. I found him immensely relevant as I went through university and then went into business. I'm never very far from Blake. I find him a presence that I find incredibly practical and useful. I think it's wise for those in power in business uh, to maintain that respect. I find him, in that sense, uh, meeting his eye sometimes. He saw the balance of uh, humanity <laughs> was under threat because he had, after all, been born in the middle of a period of uh, enlightenment, where reason reigned, eclipsing everything else. Uh, he saw, uh, as we look back now, as a prophet saw, that there were real dangers in the satanic mills. And I feel that that anti-materialism, which so isolated him in his time, would isolate him now, actually, is absolutely crucial to the health of modern society. The kings and nobles of the land have done it. Hear it not, heaven. Thy ministers have done it. Behold, London, the human awful wonder of God. I wander through each dirty street near where the dirty Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet Marks of weakness, marks of woe In every cry of every man In every infant's cry of fear In every voice, in every ban The mind-forged manacles I hear How the chimney sweepers cry Blackens o'er the church's walls and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most the midnight harlots curse from every dismal street I hear weaves around the marriage hearse and blasts the newborn infant's tear. Blake saw very clearly what was happening to England and to London. He saw that it was being turned into mechanism, into reproductive imagery, uh, into salesmanship, into information rather than understanding, into all the arts, which he called the arts of death, which the 19th and 20th centuries exploited to their utmost extent. The beggar's rags fluttering in air doth does to rags the heavens stare. Uh, one could, it sticks in your mind, but, and you wonder what it means really until you finally puzzle out in the 20th century that any nation that would allow many beggars in rags to be lying in doorsteps looking at heaven through their ragged <laughs> sleeves would be the kind of desensitized society that would punch a hole in the ozone layer and tear the heavens to rags, literally. It's as if his fall from normal life had broken him open to all sorts of perceptions which seem to us very modern.
For example, his belief that war and repressed sexuality were connected. His belief that animals should not be treated badly. And there's the poem about every cry from a hunted hare, a fibre from a brain does tear. There's the famous poem, Little Black Boy, in which he uh, suggests or asserts that all human beings are part of a divine family and that there should be no, uh, to use a modern phrase, discrimination against various sorts of people. So in all those respects, um, he was remarkably aligned to late 20th perceptions of human reality. He also, in a sense, created his own religion. And there are plenty of people who, even now, find in Blake solace, comfort, consolation, and more importantly, belief. He believed he might rebuild Jerusalem in London. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O oh clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Of course, it's quite impossible to summarize Blake's vision uh, in a phrase. For him, it was a lifetime of learning, aspiring, trying to understand. But if there's one sentence which comes close to the heart of his vision, it's when he says, to see a world in a grain of sand. Because for him, the universe was a, a total entity, an integrated whole. Things seen, things unseen, things corporeal, incorporeal, the past, the present, the future, were part of this total entity, this spiritual entity, which for him was the universe itself. To see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. He was the greatest religious poet England has ever produced. Reality for him was the whole vision of eternity which surrounded him night and day as he talks about angels surrounding him night and day. And then in the end, he talks about how his works are being admired in the palaces of eternity, how the angels are celebrating his work. And that, again, is part of his sense of eternity being present to the wise continually. He says at one point, a fool sees not the same tree as a wise man sees. This, of course, goes back to his earlier visions in Peckham Rye, where he saw trees filled with angels. But it's, it also emphasizes a more important truth, that if you could divest yourself of material vision, as he says, everyone will see what I see. And what we come to understand at the end of our own present century is that his vision is so prescient, his, his poetry and painting so marvelous, that he's of the same stature as Milton, as Chaucer, as Shakespeare. Did I tell you I was Socrates, or a sort of brother? I must have had conversations with him. I also had conversations with Jesus Christ. I have an obscure recollection of being with both of them. I should be sorry if I had any earthly fame, for whatever natural glory a man has is so much detracted from his spiritual glory. I wish to do nothing for profit. I wish to live for art. I want nothing whatever. I am quite happy. Hear the voice of the bard, who present, past, and future sees, whose ears have heard the holy word that walked among the ancient trees. 
calling the lapsed soul and weeping in the evening dew that might control the starry pole and fallen, fallen light renew. O earth, O earth, return. Arise from out the dewy grass. Night is worn and the morn rises from the slumberous mass. Turn away no more. Why wilt thou turn away? The starry floor, the watery shore, is given thee till break of day. The eye, altering, alters all.